Great granddad started the business back in the 1850s and he worked until his death in the early 1900s by which time the granddad Benjamin and his sister Polly were both working in the business and they ran it until the middle of the 20th century by which time the father took over and again supported by mum he ran it through to the latter part of the 20th century. I've been working here since 1982 full time with my wife Tanya and now we're acknowledged to be the longest established photographic studio in the world. On the back of the old carte de visite pictures, part of the inscription is copies may be available at any time. They seem to have taken that seriously and every negative in theory since the beginning of the business over 160 years ago has been kept. So what we have is a complete record of the output of a commercial studio for over 160 years. In addition to all the negatives, we also have a significant amount of business record. Now that means there are ledgers which tell us who all the pictures are of and what they're of and who they were taken for. When I started, um, what I really wanted is this holistic view of the archive. It was very special that the studio is still working and is in the same set up in the same way as it would have been in the 19th century. To see how all the elements of what is now an archive but was then just a collection of different materials, the, the negative books and the account books and the numbered uh, archive boxes, how that all works together and how you can actually trace the history of commercial photography in Britain completely through the Reeves archive which I am delighted to have found out. The project has enabled us to work out much more accurately how many images there are in the archive. There are about a quarter of a million glass plates plus of course all the film negatives that have started accumulating in the 1950s plus of course the digital files that have come since probably about the same number of film negatives as there are glass plates. Immediately when I started working here and living myself in Lewis what I was struck by is when you have spent a day looking at black and white pictures of a hundred years ago and then you walk down the town with those images in mind. It's amazing the feeling that I got from what Lewis looks now and how it used to look and how that it's like a film in front of your eyes. So we came up with this idea of having the images shown in places in Lewis where the picture was taken so that that feeling could be shared with lots of other people and it from the start has been such a success. One of the things also that my university, the University of the Arts, is very keen on is that we share our research and this is a very good example of knowledge exchange where we are able to reach audiences that you wouldn't normally necessarily reach. The Lightbox exhibitions are now into their 10th year and they've really evolved as the project has developed. More recently, whilst they're still site specific, uh, the boxes, they might show townsfolk, shopkeepers, events, spectators, and they tell the story of the town. That's been made possible by the work of the volunteer transcribers and the researchers. And also the interaction with the other archives, such as the British Newspaper Archive, which has been really interesting. We cannot do the project without a big group of volunteers and we are blessed that we have such enthusiasm in the town but also further afield. Uh, one group does the digitisation which is an enormous job. We have exhibition builders which are priceless in the way that they mount these complicated exhibitions in, the, in so very many venues. And then we have a group of researchers who are given a plate and then find out who's on the plate, what's the story, social history events are relevant to that portrait or that street scene. And it's through their work that we 
get to know much more about the archive. But what's lovely is that they stay the course. Some of them have been with us since for 10 years because it also has a real social element in it. We go to the pub together and we have regular meetings and it contributes to the well-being of our fellow Louisians because of the, the, the engagement and the enthusiasm there is for the project. One of the things that we're very keen on is to involve young people. Tom and I have been giving assemblies in local schools and we've done lots of talks in the school. There have been quite a number of related events that have developed from the project, following on from the exhibition about the suffrage movement in Lewis on the 100th anniversary of the first women to get the vote. We had an event in collaboration with Lewis Town Council where 100 schoolgirls came to the town hall for a day of activities and talks by inspiring local women. They finish the day by writing down their hopes for the future and they've placed them in a time capsule to be opened in 2028. Then there was Lewis Remembers. But the far, far greater number in Kipling's words were the ones that were known only to God. And among them were the 360 men from Lewis in Sussex, ordinary men, foundry workers, farm labourers, clerks and teachers, who also died and who stand for the ordinary. And whereas we know the legacy of the writers and the artists and the philosophers and the scientists because we live with it every day, we don't know much about those men and what they might have done. Until now, the 360 men of Lewis were brought back to life in a truly remarkable event last Armistice Day by Lewis Remembers, a small group of local people, including our historic bonfire societies who meticulously researched each of the men and their families. They knew where they lived, they knew what they did, in some cases they knew what they were like. On the evening of Armistice Day last year, 360 men matched in age with those who had died and leaving wherever possible the homes that they had left, marched silently with blazing torches through the streets converging on our war memorial. As each name was read out, one man stepped forward and extinguished his torch. It was done with immense dignity, and it was unforgettable. Frederick Lawrence of 109 South Street died at sea on the 27th of May, 1915, aged 40. Clement John Frank of 20, the High Street, killed in action on the 7th of October, 1916, aged 25. It was almost a, a call to arms for kind of young people of Lewis to, who were the similar age to the people on the War Memorial to come and represent them. Because I think the First World War is one that's filled with a lot of statistics, and a lot of big statistics about things that happened especially how it was fought was a very impersonal war with so many millions of people and millions of artillery shells and everything. I think to have his face and to have him as like a real person to know his kind of career, what he was looking to do when he got older and then to know that he was just thrown into that mess and the kind of slaughter, it's, yeah, it weighs it down and gives it a reality. I think the importance of Lewis Remembers is the impact it had on those who took part and the people who were able to attend. Events like Lewis Remembers show how an archive such as ours can engage the community on a lot of levels and in inspire it and to support it and I hope we can in the future do more of the same as the archive becomes more accessible.